Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Welcome back to Horse Center for everybody. Lots of good races around the country. Absolutely, Matt. Uh, you used to live uh, near Thistledown back in the day, and uh, Thistledown has a very good card. That, don't sleep on that Lady Jacqueline, Matt, because in the Lady Jacqueline, we see uh, old friends getting back together. Maracuja, uh, Army Wife, uh, Crazy Beautiful. That's a good race. But of course, the signature race at Thistledown is the Ohio Derby, Matt. And we're going to focus on the Ohio Derby as the race of the week. Are you ready, sir? Yes, absolutely, Brian. I am going to throw that race up. Morning line odds, Matt. I don't necessarily agree with these morning line odds. But we got a field of eight, although you're telling me that one horse is going to be scratched, aren't you? Yes, Brian. It was reported on Horse Racing Nation yesterday that Brigadier General will not be running in the Ohio Derby, giving us a field of seven. Hey, you know, you put up $500,000, you would expect to get some good horses. And I think that's happened in the Ohio Derby. Yeah, Brigadier General, one of the long shots is out. So that still leaves, uh, I think, five uh, stakes winners, five principals here in the Ohio Derby. So let's get right to it, Matt. Uh, morning line favorite, I thought it might be way to Barrio, but they went with Tawny Port, Matt, the number seven. Part of the reason might be Irad Ortiz Jr. coming in to ride the Brad Cox train, Tawny Port. Yeah, yeah, the Irad Brad Cox factor certainly is going to affect the betting. But, uh, you know, I agree from a certain uh, point of view that if you look at the past performances, I feel like White of Barrio should be the favorite. Well, White of Barrio is the only grade one winner in the field, Matt, so that makes sense. But you have to look past the Kentucky Derby to be on the White of Barrio bandwagon because certainly Tawny Port was a more competitive runner in the Kentucky Derby. Now, I think that fast pace that we've talked so much about, the ridiculously fast pace in this year's Kentucky Derby, had something to do with the fact that Tawny Port was well ahead of horses like White of Barrio and also Classic Causeway at the finish. But the truth is, uh, Tawny Port was the horse that ran the best Kentucky Derby of those three horses coming out of that race. None of them have run since. And Tawny Port, you know, at the eighth pole, he was in with a shot. He made a pretty good move on the inside, Matt. He couldn't sustain that bid, but again, I, I think that fast pace might have had something to do with his, his good finish. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about at the eighth pole. I think he was around fifth at that point and ended up finish, finishing seventh in the race. Um, he, he went into the Kentucky Derby based on his victory in the Lexington Stakes. Uh, shortly before the Kentucky Derby, that wasn't the strongest field uh, uh, of some other Derby preps, especially if you want to compare Derby preps to what White Abario did down at Gulfstream Park when he won the Florida Derby closest to the run for the Roses. And he also won the Holy Bull where he defeated Mo Donegal, the eventual Belmont Stakes winner. Yeah, down in Florida, he was beating horses like Mo Donegal and the Holy Bull. Simplification in both the Holy Bull and the Florida Derby, who ran a good race in the Kentucky Derby, uh, charge it as well. So White of Barrio beat good horses down there. Tawny Port did beat Ethereal Road, who's also in this Ohio Derby and I think has a shot uh, in that Lexington. But if you look at the Lexington, you know, he's coming out of a decent race at Turfway Park. And he ran a good race in the Lexington. It's it's hard to knock Tawny Port's uh, series of races. He's been a consistent rallier for trainer Brad Cox. And Brad Cox, uh, again, at this time of year, we see it every year, Matt. Brad Cox is winning a lot of races. He certainly is. He's, been, he's winning a lot of big races at uh, tracks all around the country. And quite frankly, that makes, him, uh, makes it hard to discount any horse's Brad Cox has, be it in the Ohio Derby or when we talk about the Mother Goose in our next feature. Nine furlongs on Saturday, the uh, $500,000 Ohio Derby, Matt. Uh, Tawny Port will be coming from a little bit farther back than White Abario, the two horses we expect to vie for favoritism here. Uh, White Abario should sit a stalking trip. It looks like there is a little bit of speed. 
And White Barrio has the ability to stay close and pounce like he did in those wins in Florida. I will ask you, though, Matt, White Barrio has never won a race outside of Gulfstream Park. Yeah, and yeah, and you have to be a little bit concerned about that. Um, that is home base for White Barrio and his trainer Safi Joseph, uh, who re- who just dominated this uh, year at in the championship meeting at uh, Gulfstream Park. Um, so yeah, y- you have to have that question in your mind. Absolutely. I also wonder who's going to come out of the the tough Kentucky Derby the best. And of course, that's hard for us to know going in. But the Ohio Derby features the three horses, uh, seventh place, Tawny Port, 11th place, Classic Causeway, and 16th place, White of Barrio. That sounds not so hot, but I think all three horses, you know, there's either excuses or, or that seventh place, he was only beaten five and a half lengths, was Tawny Port in the Kentucky Derby. So these are three horses of quality. Uh, classic Causeway of the three, all three are working well for their return, uh, about six weeks removed, six or seven weeks removed from that uh, Kentucky Derby run. All three are working pretty well. Classic Causeway would look to have the most speed of the three, Matt. And of course, he was bothered a little bit early and never had a chance to show any speed in the Kentucky Derby. But he kind of uh, went around the track and, and finished in, in mid-pack. It wasn't a terrible performance from Classic Causeway. But he's coming off two performances in a row now where he's finished 11th. Yeah, and certainly you, you, you have to look at those performances as disappointing, it coming on the heels of those very nice wins at Tampa on the Derby Trail, uh, front-running efforts in the Sam F. Davis and the Tampa Derby. And I guess, Brian, the uh, the ownership of Classic Cause was disappointed in those performances. I don't know what the story is or if there is even a story, but they may have made a trainer change from Brian Lynch to Kenny McPeak following those two losses. Yeah, that's an interesting trainer change um, to – relatively well-known trainers, uh, maybe moving to a, a slightly more high-profile trainer in Kenny McPeak. Uh, Classic Causeway, you know, if you look at those Tampa Bay races, you certainly think he would have every shot to win the Ohio Derby. But then on the other hand, two uh, 11th place finishes in a row, it's hard to know if the horse is going to show any uh, signs of frustration or, or, or being beaten down a little bit. But uh, I can't throw Classic Causeway out in this spot Matt, we've we've said there's some speed. Classic Causeway, Pineapple Man, a little bit there. Um, maybe uh, uh, that sets the table for Tawny Port a little bit, but maybe it also sets the table for Ethereal Road, who we mentioned just a little bit. He's third to one on the morning line, and and I think that's about right for Ethereal Road. I think he'll go off as the third choice here in the Ohio Derby. Um, two big wins uh, sandwiched around his three graded stakes efforts. A big maiden win that you know looked really visually impressive. And then last time, the Sir Barton on Preakness weekend looked visually impressive. He rallied and won both easily. In between three graded stakes, uh, they're, not, they're not great. They're not bad. He was second in the Rebel, fourth in the Lexington, seventh in the Bluegrass. And I don't think his trips in either of those Keeneland races were good. Is Ethereal Road just going to look really good against cheaper and come up short against graded stakes horses, or is he a real threat in this Ohio Derby? Well, that's the question, Brian, and we will certainly find that out here in the Ohio Derby because I think the Ohio Derby is, you know, is in between those kind of scenarios that you described. He should be more comfortable with this level of competition. We should certainly note that that victory in the Sir Barton, the Sir Barton uh, stakes was restricted to horses that had not won a previous stakes race. So again, now here we is back to uh, graded stakes company and we'll see how he does. Yeah, Ethereal Road, uh, trained by Dwayne Lucas, of course, Quality Road. I, I'm not sure I completely agree with you on, on the level because I, I think this Ohio Derby is quite good. I think yeah. the, the, the five uh, top horses in the Ohio Derby is quite good. So I don't know if this is an easier spot than than the Rebel or, or the Lexington, certainly. Uh, the Bluegrass, you could certainly argue, was was the toughest spot of all. But uh, Ethereal Road, you know, I, 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 I like the fact that he had another confidence builder last time. 
Um, you know, he was scratched out of the Belmont. That's a little concern. I guess he had a little bit of an uh, issue there. Uh, but they bring him back quickly, as Dwayne Lucas does, and Ethereal Road with a little bit of speed in the race, nine for a long. So against grade three, 500,000, it, it looks more like a solid grade two to me on paper. But uh, I kind of like Ethereal Road a little bit. I, I'm I'm betwixt and between, Matt, as far as my favorite rallier in the field, Ethereal Road or Tawny Porter. Yeah, Brian. Uh, um for me, I get. I think the race boils down to uh, Tony Port um, and White Abario. Uh, I, I think the the horse that has the most impressive victories on his resume is White Abario. Um, I'm I'm not sure what to expect uh, when the horses go to the gate in terms of odds, but uh, to me, uh, White Abario, Tony Port. Um, I guess I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Tawny Port just because of the momentum that the Brad Cox barn has right now. Yeah, you can't uh, underestimate uh, a, a barn like that, especially this time of year where, like I said before, they seem to really clean up this time of year at the Brad Cox barn. One other horse we definitely should mention, Matt, is Barisi. He's 9-2 on the morning line. I don't, I don't see that happening. I, I think that's a a mistake by the morning line maker here. I think Barisi will be closer to 10 to one, uh, but he interests me a little bit too. And he's kind of the, 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 the fifth of the five that I was talking about is as quality stakes winners in the field. Uh, of course, his stakes win came against New York Reds, but he was undefeated going into that Wood Memorial. And the Wood Memorial, of course, has become a key race. He did not run badly in the Wood Memorial. Oddly, they dropped him uh, down into dropped him down into a sprint race last time against New York Reds, and he was third, a disappointing third there. But that might be a little bit more than a workout for Barisi. I think he could bounce back a little bit and show a little bit more here in this Ohio Derby. That could be the case, and of course, the New York Bred won uh, won his first three starts of his career. Um, and I think we should also note, Brian, um, that. The Ohio Derby is a stakes race where the horses are allowed to run with Lasix. And they will all be running with Lasix except for Classic Causeway. And Barisi and White Abario will be first time Lasix in the race. Could be a factor. I don't know. We can't predict whether that's going to be a factor or not. But Barisi is one of the, the horses that's first time Lasix. I agree. Uh, I thought he, you know, he did run decently in the wood, uh, a race that turned out to be a key race, producing the Belmont Stakes winner and the Preakness winner. Um, but uh, to me, I think this might be a little bit tough again for Barisi. And again, the mile and an eighth distance, I'm afraid, might just be a tad too long. It's a good point. The first point you made, Matt, especially the uh, the first time Lasix, because that that is a factor. That's a handicapping factor, whether we want to admit it or not. The first time Lasix can move horses up, and both White Abario and Barisi are picking up Lasix for the first time. The other two, it looks like Brigadier General's out, so dropping G's, uh, I think, is a real long shot with very little shot. Pineapple Man is the second New York bred trained by Mike Maker. He's got two New York breds coming in. Pineapple Man looks more like a, a speed um, a speed threat in here more than a horse that I think can actually win the Ohio Derby. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, we've been mentioning the horses that have speed. I think, you know, in my eyes, yes, they are, they are more horses that prefer to do their running on the front end, um, but don't appear to have runaway speed. Um, so I, I think the Ohio Derby overall is going to be a race where uh, – you know, horses can uh, can run in whatever style and will have a good chance to show their best, whether they are come from off the pace horses, like we mentioned, or or Pineapple Man or Classic Causeway that prefer to be uh, running out front. Yeah, once again, I agree with you. I think this on paper looks like a, a, a very fair race. Uh, often you see races where you think, oh, the speed horses have the advantage or, or sometimes even the, the real come from behinders. But this looks like a fair race on paper. The Ohio Derby, part of a big card at Thistledown on Saturday, should be a very good one. We're going to give our top picks 
a little bit later in the show, Matt Shipman. First, I want to go to uh, to New York, to Belmont Park, Big Sandy. Uh, the Mother Goose, the historic Mother Goose, uh, grade two, $250,000. It's been run for a long time. I was disappointed to see the, uh, the number of fillies that actually entered the Mother Goose yesterday when the entries came out. But uh, the good news is every filly in the race is a stakes winner. Yeah, everyone's a stakes winner. Three of them are graded stakes winners. Um, a couple of them were in the Kentucky Oaks, you know. Uh, boy, you look at the mother goose, goose and the history of it and the great, great horses that have run in the race. I just think the mother goose has 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 fallen on tough times where it's placed in the calendar and, and changes in uh, in uh, what's offered at, at Belmont Park. Let's face it, Brian, just two weeks ago on that big Belmont stakes card, three-year-old fillies had an offering in the acorn and the mother goose is just a few weeks before saratoga opens and there's three big grade ones for three-year-old fillies at the spa leaving the mother goose sitting here no longer a grade one now a grade two so i'm not surprised that it's only a field of five yeah, it's a one turn mile and a sixteenth at Belmont Park, so it's a it, it's a it's similar distance. It used to be nine furlongs. It's a similar distance now to the Acorn, and uh, kind of more of a prep, if you will, uh, for those Saratoga races. The Coaching Club American Oaks is not too far down the road, as Matt mentioned at Saratoga. But regardless, we have five stakes winners in the field, Matt. Uh, I, I think Juju's map is the one that the betters are really going to gravitate to. Uh, you see our odds there at three to two where she's a, a relatively clear favorite, but I think she could go lower than that classy Philly from the trainer, Brad Cox. Uh, on the other hand, she's only had one race this year and it was an allowance race. She looked good uh, on Kentucky Derby, or I guess it was Kentucky Oaks day where she got uh, out there on the lead coasted. Uh, it wasn't too uh, uh, grueling of a pace by any means, and Juju's map was much the best in that allowance field uh, of uh, three-year-old and older fillies that day. But that's her only race since running second last year in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Yeah, and and last year Juju's map was also the winner of the Grade One Alcibiades at uh, in Kentucky. Uh, uh, talented horse. I think Brad Cox has been handling her carefully this year. Um, she wasn't quite ready to uh, make a run at the Kentucky Oaks. So Cox was, you know, cautious, went to that allowance race, looking ahead at some of these, you know, three-year-old Philly races that we have been alluding to. So I don't look at that, uh, allowance race as as a negative i just look at it as that's what juju's map was ready for ran a really nice race off the layoff and is ready to move on um in all of these really good three-year-old philly races that are to come yes matt i i i don't i don't think of it as a negative either and i didn't mean to say it as a negative i, I guess what i'm saying is she's only had one race in the last what seven eight months now and i i just don't know how good the race was actually because i, I thought it was a pretty easy pace and and she pulled away late um, it was solid in every way and and you know uh, uh, an allowance race at churchill downs uh, with that the purses that they offer uh, it certainly isn't going to be a real weak field but uh wasn't 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 a powerhouse field and i thought she had an easy trip so i i just what i meant to say is that she's going to certainly be moving up as she faces four other stakes winners here and at the low ads i'm i'm not sure that i want to jump on her but certainly juju's map the alcibades winner as you said grade one at caneland uh never been worse than second was second in the breeders cup juvenile phillies behind echo zulu if uh if she's only better as a three-year-old she certainly is the horse to beat she's also uh, the, probably the filly that's going to be on the lead early, although she's one from on the lead and just off the pace. So Juju's map, certainly a big presence here in this mother goose. But I also want to talk about Shahama a little bit, Matt, because Shahama was a filly that I fell in love with a, a little bit. You, you know me, I'm watching some of those races from Dubai, and, and I, I heard about her before she made her debut. So I watched her first 
very first race at Dubai because she's a sister of looking at Lucky, a half sister to looking at Lucky out of Munnings. And she was impressive each and every time in Dubai, four for four over there. Uh, including the UAE Oaks and you know she had she had some traffic in a race or two but she was a dominant force on the three-year-old Philly scale over there she came over here she had uh, a little bit of a long layoff as Todd Pletcher eased her into his training uh, regimen an American program and then in the Kentucky Oaks she just was way back early but she made some progress and uh, all in all I don't think that Kentucky Oaks was a bad performance at all Beaten again, five and a half lengths or so uh, behind some really good fillies like Secret Oath and Nest. Yeah, it it was a decent performance for sure, Brian. First start in America, um, you know, a new barn with Todd Pletcher, um, and and now uh, a second start, Mother Goose. Todd Pletcher is looking to win his seventh, Brian, seventh Mother Goose. Um, I think he's actually tied with. Uh, uh, Wayne Lucas for uh, the most Mother Goose victories. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Certainly, Shahama is a talented filly, and uh, we'll see in her second American start. Certainly has to be a serious win contender. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a far different kind of race than she saw in her first American race. I, I would expect her to move forward off, to, off her first American race. And now she drops from a 14-horse Kentucky Oaks into a five-horse field here. I think she's got the least speed in the field. But on the other hand, I think she does have more speed than she showed the Kentucky Oaks and can sit fifth, but uh, in the picture early. And I, I actually think this race might set up for it just a little bit, again, making her second race in the country. The next two fillies we should talk about, Matt, are, are both uh, – uh, graded stakes performers, both stakes winners, both have looked good in New York before, but both are also kind of wild cards. We'll start with Gerrymander because Gerrymander was certainly a very nice two-year-old. Much like Juju's map, she's never been uh, worse than second until she returned last time and ran in that fast eight bells uh, on Kentucky Derby weekend, Matt, and things didn't really go her way in the seven furlong eight bells. Yeah, that's for sure. Got off to a bad start, and and, and you mentioned the uh, the fast pace and bad start. It was kind of all over for her uh, at <clears throat> at that point. Um, you mentioned uh, last year uh, looked really good. Uh, won the tempted, and before that was second in the Grade One for Zet behind the eventual two year old champion Echo Zulu. Yeah, just like Juju's map, who was uh, pretty well beaten in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, Jerry Mander was a uh, certainly well beaten in the in the Grade One for Zet. Uh, the one thing I don't like about Jerry Mander is her two losses last year. She was pretty well trounced, including that for Zet and her debut. But she is consistent. Don't uh, don't hold it against her too much. That performance in the Eight Bells, they ran very fast, and Jerry Mander had a little trouble at the start really a prep for a little bit longer race, which I think she likes better anyway. So Jerry Mander, trained by Chad Brown. Now he's got to watch out for Chad Brown. Certainly a threat in here if she can return to her strong two-year-old form, and, and there's good reason to believe she can. Another wild card is Venti Valentine, because Venti Valentine had been a very good, very consistent filly. She looked great. She beat some decent fillies in the busher. She was right with Ness last year. She ran a pretty good gazelle. And then in the Kentucky Oaks, I guess she had some traffic. She never got as close to the lead as she wanted to, then had traffic. And uh, she pretty much threw in the towel before they hit the stretch. The Kentucky Oaks was ugly. But now she's back in New York in a five-horse field. Uh, we might see a little bit more of what we saw in the busher. Yeah, that's for sure. And and she was also second in the, in the Demoiselle, Demoiselle also. Um, in, in the Oaks, she got checked hard. You mentioned uh, in, in that traffic that she ran into, and and then and right th then then that was it for her. But back on her home uh, home track, um, yeah, she definitely could be a factor in this race. A little a little bit like we talked about with some of those horses coming out of well beaten performances in the Kentucky Derby. You got to wonder if Vente Valentine, especially, or maybe Gerrymander too. It's a little discouraged by what happened to them in the last race, and they're not as good next time out. We'll see, but they're both classy fillies who certainly belong in the discussion with Juju's map and Shahama. 
The other one I'm not so sure about, Matt. She's a stakes winner, Midnight Stroll, but uh, it came against State Reds at Tampa Bay Downs, Florida State Reds. Um, I guess she had some trouble in the Black Eyed Susan, but she really was never a threat. She's got some speed, but uh, I don't know if this uh, Terra Nova Philly fits in with the other four on a class perspective. Yeah, I would think so also because you throw in there that her maiden victory was also at Tampa against Florida Breds. So, uh, and then that showing against Open Company and a graded stake uh, in the Black Eyed Susan. Yeah, uh, this is still asking a lot in my view. I agree. All right, Matt, it's that time. We, uh, we, we looked at the Ohio Derby. We looked at the Mother Goose, the two races of the week. I want to remind our our fans out there, too, uh, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here on Horse Racing Nation, go ahead and do that now. But what I really want to know is, Matt, who is your top pick? Let's do the Ohio Derby first, since we went through the Ohio Derby first. Sorry, ladies. Who's your top pick in the Ohio Derby? Brian, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to jump on the Brad Cox bandwagon. Um, and, and just with that question mark in my mind about uh, White Abario needing to win away from Gulfstream Park. I'm going to be really interested to see who ends up the favorite in this race, uh, Tony Port or uh, White Abario. But sitting here taping the show with you, I'm going to lean towards Tony Port. You're going to go with Tony Port. Okay. I I am definitely on the White Abario bandwagon here in the Ohio Derby. You're right. I, I really don't know who's going to be the favorite. I think either one, neither one would surprise me. It should be either White Abario or Tony Port. So we're, one of us is on the favorite, I would think, unless they just jump like crazy on D. Wayne Lucas's ethereal road coming off that Sir Barton win. But I think White Abario is the class of the race. I think all he needs to do is go back to those Florida races, the Holy Bowl, the Florida Derby to win this. Uh, Kentucky Derby, squeezed, checked, never got near the lead, was wide throughout. I'm going to draw a line through that Kentucky Derby. White Abario is the horse for me, Matt. As, uh, as folks watching our show on YouTube or Horse Racing Nation, you can see our picks here. But for those listening on the podcast, Matt, they don't know who your mother goose pick is yet. So why don't you tell me who you like in the mother goose? Yep, I'm going to be a little bit of a broken record here, and I'm going to go with Brad Cox again. I'm going to pick Juju's map. All right, this time I'm pretty sure you're on the favorite, and I think I'm on the second choice. I'm going to go with Todd Pletcher's Shahama. Loved her in Dubai. I think her race in the Kentucky Oaks was sneaky good. I think she can just sit a close last, a close fifth early, and then make her move on the turn. And I'd see her rolling late, Matt. I like Shahama in the Mother Goose. There you have it, folks. There are picks for the Ohio Derby, the Mother Goose. We wish you all the best of luck in your wagers this weekend. Before we say goodbye, Matt, let me get a parting shot from you, my friend in New Jersey. Thank you, Brian. Um, hey, uh, again, as always, I want to thank everybody for watching Horse Center. We'll be with you all summer as we look forward to the big summer meetings. Del Mar's going to open soon. Saratoga's going to open soon. So plenty of exciting stuff this summer. Stay with us on Horse Center. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, that's true. Saratoga and Delmar are just around the corner. But next week, I think we might even have a bigger weekend of racing than this week, Matt. Uh, Delaware Park has their big day led by the handicap in the Oaks. Uh, Belmont has uh, some good horses. Life is Good's return in the uh, Nehru is expected as well as the Dwyer. But we're going to focus on Churchill Downs next week with that Stephen Foster and a bunch of good graded stakes there. So we'll be back next week talking Stephen Foster and more right here on Horse Center. Thanks for watching, folks. Thanks to Derby Wars, the best contest site out there, our sponsor, and to Candace Curtis for the race graphics. We'll see you next week right here on Horse Center.